Okay, welcome back to the, uh, the, to the afternoon session, uh, which will be on uh, robustness, stochastics, and uncertainty. And uh, we're very happy that uh, Sasha Rackley is going to be uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation and thanks for coming. Um, so the, the organizers asked to talk about connections between statistical learning, statistics, optimization, online learning. And so initially this talk was uh, just a, a, a horrendous compendulum and, and uh, a couple of people looked at it and said, no, 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 no. Uh, this is supposed to be a tutorial. So right now it's uh, very low. It's just about 35 uh, slides for two hours. Very low on, on content. Uh, 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 if, if I undershot or overshot, the, I apologize. Uh, if, if this is too easy, I apologize. If it's too hard, please ask. Um, if I say something that, you know, that, that a concept that is not known, uh, please let me know. So uh, we'll talk about uh, mostly about learning. And uh, definitely learning has been one of the main um, consumers uh, machine learning has been one of the main consumers of optimization in the last, uh, I guess, five, ten years. Um, and and uh, I will show a couple of directions where I think a lot more uh, can be done by optimizers and both in discrete and continuous optimization. Um, and, and that's uh, kind of an exciting uh, um, um, kind of uh, field, I think. Okay, so, so what does this talk about? Very broadly, um, we'll, we'll talk about several ways to phrase learning. Depending on how you phrase it, you get a different optimization method. Uh, 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 we'll discuss some basics of online prediction, online learning methods. Um, and uh, I will uh, make a few con strong connections between statistical learning and online learning. These are probably concepts that you haven't seen. Um, uh, and, and as well as uh, first order uh, optimization. Um, so again, please uh, stop me if uh, there is a concept that uh, is unknown. Okay, actually uh, I will start with a board. Um, this is an example that I like to, to, to start with. Um, suppose that uh, you're trying to predict a sequence of bits. So the, the sequence y1, y2 uh, comes and, and the values are let's say in 0, 1. Um, and uh, what, do we, what do we mean by predicting it? Well, you, 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 on, at every time step, you output a, a prediction. Let's say it's a y hat uh, 1 uh, up to uh, you know, y hat 2 and so forth. y hat 2 and so forth. And now you count the number of correct uh, uh, predictions. And let, let's say ct bar is the uh, average or uh, the, the, the ratio of um, fraction of correct predictions fraction of correct uh, predictions. Um, and uh, uh, let me denote y hat t uh, by fraction of, uh, of uh, ones in the sequence, just the average of the, of the y sequence, OK? Up to time t. So the subscript up to time t. OK. So, uh, uh, first question is, you know, suppose that you know that the sequence is Bernoulli. Bernoulli IID, okay, with some unknown bias P. And you're trying to do this prediction. What would you predict? This is an undergraduate uh, question. Sophomore, <laughs> freshman. Majority, majority. Of course, you predict the majority. You predict the so y hat t uh, is a, an indicator of whether uh, uh, y bar t is more than one half. Okay, uh, and uh, what what does this give you? Well, it gives you pro uh, the, the the correct you know the fraction of correct predictions goes in some sense that you can make precise to the maximum of p and 1 minus p, of course, right? So the, 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 the maximum of the, the how, how uh, imbalanced the sequence is. And by the, by the law of large numbers, it's going to be y bar t and 1 minus y bar t, right? So you can replace the, the p's by the average. Uh, more precisely, if you want to know the, the more precise statement, so you can say that lim uh, inf of uh, ct bar minus max of y bar t and 1 minus y bar t. All right, so this lymph uh, is uh, 
uh, non-negative, almost surely. Okay. This is a random sequence. This is a almost sure statement. Okay. So that's the kind of that's the the notion in which uh, this uh, squiggly uh, arrow is pointing. Okay. So the the proportion of correct predictions is going to be a roughly uh, a proportion of uh, y bar t and uh, one minus y by y bar t. Okay. So the punchline now is that this statement, let me call it by a star, this trivial statement, uh, there exists an algorithm, a prediction algorithm, that attains star for any sequence y1 and so forth. There is no generative process that is required on this sequence. It holds for any sequence. Okay. Now, of course, that's an almost sure statement, so it's clear that the method itself has to be randomized. Right? In fact, it's clear that the method has to be randomized because uh, for any method, you can come up with a sequence that will break it right, on every round. For any, for any deterministic method, right? Any deterministic method, you just output the y, uh, uh, output the bit that's opposite to what it would predict, right? So that's that's clear. But this is a, a non-trivial statement. So I invite you to spend uh, maybe a 15 seconds to try to think how to do this, uh, how you would you would get such a result. And, and let me just make it even simpler. You know, try to think of how one would attain a proportion of correct predictions. Uh, approximately, you know, max for a finite. But let's say I, I, I will give you a finite horizon n. Can you come up with a method that will attain maximum of y bar n one minus y bar n plus you know something that uh, is uh, uh, um, a little of one, right? So it goes down with n. Right? Anyone has a suggestion? Yes. If you sample corresponding to like the, how I say correctly, if you like look at the distribution over currently seen values, would could you like sample out from according to that distribution and then return that to print? Um, that would uh, essentially go with the. Uh, it's a randomized strategy uh, whose expected uh, whose value is the, the the mean so far, right? So the mean so far is not going to do it. Um, It has to be something else. Some kind of oh yeah, sorry. Yes. The randomized algorithm that the fraction of, uh, I mean, the property that picks zero is equal to the fraction of the zeros that has been seen in the current sequences. So I think that was that's what was uh, suggested, but I think that will not do it. So you can come up with a counter example to that. Um, so you do some kind of boosting. I mean, uh, you can do, well, if you know about experts, you would do some kind of uh, experts algorithm. That's one uh, uh, solution. Another solution is given by David Blackwell, who was a, a faculty here. So it's nice to talk about this. Uh, 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 was a in, uh, in the statistics department. So here's a, a, a strategy. You, you, write, uh, you, know, you draw a, 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 a 0, 1 to 0, 1 box. Um, on this axis, you plot y bar. On this axis, you plot, uh, um, let me not put the c, c bar, right? Um, this is the center. Draw, uh, this is like a flag. And where do you want to end up, right? You want to end up in this uh, region. So if you know Blackwell approachability, that's suggesting uh, uh, how you should do it. Um, right? Why do you want to be in this uh, uh, triangle? Because you want to be above uh, y bar and 1 minus y bar. Right? So you want to be in this region. So the method is the following. At, the, at this current moment, well, if you're here, you're, you're fine. You don't have to do anything. Right? You can flip a coin. Um, if you are here, predict deterministically, um, I guess, a 0. If you're here, predict deterministically uh, the other bit. And if you're here, in terms of the, so the, the, the current point is uh, uh, y 
bar t, c bar t, right? Th these are the statistics that you keep. How many times you correctly predicted and how many times one appeared in the sequence, right? So these are the, the only two statistics you know. You, you need to know about the sequence. If you're in this triangle, you connect this line, project it onto this axis, and this is your mixed strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Completely non-obvious, right? This is a, how do you get this? Where, where does this come from, right? And, and um, um, this is roughly what this talk is about. Uh, and uh, so that's what I, <laughs> that's what I uh, talked about. And, and this is actually from the paper of uh, David Blackwell. Um, so how many of you know about the black hole approachability and the vector valued payoffs, the minimax theorem? Okay, only a couple of people, okay. So um, David Blackwell was an amazing person, you know, he's done um, really beautiful work uh, in, in various areas. Um, I think this is one of his last papers and it talks about this problem, okay? Uh, uh, and and uh, here, here's a, a quote from him. The contrast between the minimax predictor, that's the one for arbitrary sequence, and the base predictor, that's the, this, this one, right, um, is, is strong. The minimax predictor is not obvious, as, as we saw. It satisfies this star with, uh, for every uh, uh, sequence, right? That, that, for him, that's the sequence. Uh, but the proof is not easy. The base predictor, that's just the, you know, minimize the empirical loss, you can view it as an empirical minimizer, uh, uh, is completely obvious. Um, it's not randomized and it satisfies this for almost all sequences, but under the stochastic model, right? And the proof is simple. So um, uh, kind of the point that I, I, I'm, I'm trying to make is that, you know, we can be lazy and we can assume that the data are IID and then it's usually clear what to do. Uh, you minimize some kind of uh, average uh, empirical risk minimization is the kind of the keyword here. Um, uh, uh, but it turns out that one can get similar results by working harder uh, for arbitrary sequences. And that's a, a result that's much more appealing because it does not rely on the IID nature of, um, of the model, right? And hopefully the method is more robust because it does not rely on the IID nature. When I say IID, is it clear? Everyone knows what IID is, right? So independent and identically, identically distributed. Okay. Sorry. So the statement in there, the proof is not easy. Yeah. That's about that proof? I mean, or... or, or uh, it's about this particular proof, right. And, and we'll see some examples where uh, it's not easy. Um, on the other hand, I will give... Um, I will show that it's a dynamic program, and there are... There's no magic to it, right? This seems like magic, but there isn't, it, it, we, we can take magic out of this. That's a very good, good question, right? Okay. So we'll actually start from statistical learning where you do assume that the, the <laughs> data are IID, and then we'll move to uh, um, this individual sequence world um, slowly. So we have enough time. Okay. All right, so um, uh, the model that I will consider or, or the setting that I will consider, is that we don't, don't just have bits, but bits come with some Xs, right? Some side information. And that's the more, more interesting situation where you have a tuples. That's the, kind of the usual machine learning or statistical setting. You have covariates, something you know. It's a vector of what you know about, let's say, the person uh, and so forth. And then Y is the response. In this case, it's going to be uh, either a real, real value number or uh, for the most of the uh, um, presentation, it's just going to be plus minus one, right? So again, bits, but the bits are come with some Xs, right? The, the covariates. And, and we, hope, we have a hope that uh, uh, a linear function W times X is a good explanation of Y. And the reason I did not make this more formally is because there, is, uh, uh, th th there are several ways of uh, uh, formalizing this hope, right? So one, one can formalize this in the form of a stochastic model. So y is equal to w times x plus noise, and that's what a statistician would do. Or uh, one can hope that that's the case by, by trying to do as well as a benchmark, which is only small when this is in, in fact correct, right? So that, that's what's called statistical, lear statistical learning. We'll make it, we'll make it formal. 
Um, uh, but that's uh, roughly the, the, uh, the idea. Um, this is the simplest thing you can imagine, right? W times x. Uh, so the, the, the way that we hope that the y is explained from x is by a linear function. Um, but that already captures quite a few interesting scenarios. One of them is uh, this matrix completion or the movie rating prediction problem. Let me describe it to you. Um, we observe n. n is always going to be the horizon or the, the sample size okay, for us. It's the same n as, as in this question. And what we observe is uh, n movie user pairs with the rating, like or dislike. So let's say each xt is just the identity of the user and the identity of the movie. This is the, the, the 0, 0, 001 vector. OK, so the, uh, xt here is actually a matrix. And I apologize, I'm going to be writing small letters rather than capital letters for a matrix. It's unusual, but I will reserve uh, uh, capital letters for random variables. So uh, x is a matrix, 0, 1 is just the indicator at the movie user uh, location. And y is whether the person liked the movie or not. Right? So you're given maybe a batch of the, these data and you want to do something, or you're given this as a sequence. Right? And, and you hope, and this is a, a usual uh, assumption or a hope, is that there is a low rank matrix or maybe a low trace norm, uh, low nuclear norm uh, matrix W that will explain the y's from the x's. Right? That's the correspondence. Is, is that clear why this is a linear problem? Much of what I'm going to say carries over to nonlinear problems. This is just way, you know, much, much easier to, to talk about the linear case. Okay. And, and so I, I, we haven't yet specified what, what, what is learning, right? And, and, and depending on how we set this up, uh, that will define somehow the, the, the algorithm that we're going to come up with, the optimization problem. Um, and, and I want to emphasize that learning uh, uh, is out of sample performance, right? So whatever the definition of learning we come up with, it should be out of sample somehow, right? So you've, you've seen some data, and now you have to make a prediction out of sample, right? Um, so just writing down, let's say, you know, fit to data plus some penalty, uh, it, it's not clear why this is learning until you show that this actually does what you want, right? In terms of the out of sample performance. Okay. So a, a natural method to uh, uh, that, that, that that people would would think of is just fitting the data, right? So uh, given a class of uh, um, of vectors or matrices find that explanation that bet best fits the data. And here I'm going to be using uh, a absolute loss. Uh, we, can we can take instead a hinge loss. The hinge loss is um, a uh, hinge, hinge loss is defined as a L of a, b max of 0 and 1 minus a, b. So we could use that. Pretty much nothing will change. Um, I am still thinking of y's now as, as a, as a uh, plus minus 1 variable. So in fact, you can just say it's 1 minus y times the inner product. OK. And, and uh, from now, now on, I will denote this objective as L hat. Hat uh, from now on will signify dependence on the data. right? So this is a data dependent objective. And so we will, we will think of this as a L hat of W, as a function of W. Right. Any questions at this point? What is that? The summation? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, yeah, this is T. Yes, thank you. What is F? What is F? So F is something I haven't yet specified. Um, I, um, in the, to make the exposition simpler, it will often be a ball. So it's a vector that lives in, in some norm ball, right? With respect to some norm. I, I will make it more precise soon. OK, so some examples. For the matrix completion example, it would be natural to take, to replace the rank constraint. So we, we're, we're hoping that there is a low rank explanation of uh, 
y from x, again, th this should be t's, uh, uh, it makes sense to take f to be a nuclear norm ball. So remember that nuclear norm is, uh, is, is a sum of singular values of the matrix. Um, and sometimes, perhaps, it makes sense to uh, cap the uh, prediction uh, values w by 1, because after all, we're trying to predict a number of, of like, dislike, plus, minus 1, right? Okay. But sometimes I will drop this uh, when we want to look at the dual norm ball. And um, if we're thinking of uh, the original problem as a uh, rank R matrices, then uh, it makes sense to think of the, this bound tau as a square root of R times the product of the dimensions of the matrix to include those uh, matrices, right? So this is a relaxation of that set, um, and, and that's one example. Okay? So a question now is, you know, why is, why is W hat good in terms of prediction uh, of, of future ratings, right? And that's the question, right? So we, we, we want to talk about learning, but I propose some optimization problem. Why is the solution of this optimization problem any good for, for in terms of future, right? So now we have to talk about future, right? And so how do you how do you formalize the notion of a future? And one way to do it is through the setting of statistical learning, uh, where you assume that the data that you've seen, in fact, uh, are an IID sample from some unknown distribution, right? And you're going to be evaluated on another. Uh, point x, y from the same distribution, right? So if you subscribe to statistical learning uh, uh, kind of framework, you have to believe that out there there is a, this distribution. And what you've seen is a bunch of IID sample, you know, a, 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 a bunch of IID uh, uh, pairs from that uh, distribution. The distribution is unknown to us. So that's important, right? The distribution is unknown. We don't want to assume that we know the distribution. Again, you can pick a different loss function. Um, in fact, you could pick a square to make it regression. Uh, uh, it would just complicate the analysis a bit more, and so I want to keep it as simple as possible. So let's stick with the absolute value as the loss function, right? The loss function is what compares the y to the prediction, right? OK, so if you think of matrix completion, uh, this is a bit problematic, right? The, 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 the IID assumption for matrix completion with a movie example in mind, that's a little bit problematic, right? It's, it's, it's a stretch of imagination that uh, uh, what you observed was an IID, uh, uh, you know, user picks a, 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 a movie at, at, at random and then uh, um, uh, this is a kind of an, uh, some kind of IID process. It's a stretch, right? Uh, but let's just stick with it and, and see how far we can get and then we'll move to something more interesting. OK, and, and so here is the uh, kind of conundrum. And of course, if, if you've seen this, this is kind of trivial. Uh, the empirical risk minimization, for, so from now on, that W hat is the one that minimizes L hat, right? I'm going to call it empirical risk minimizer. It just fits the data, right? So that's the empirical risk mi minimizer. The empirical risk minimization minimizes this L hat objective. But what we want is we want to minimize the L of W, right? L of W is the out of sample performance on a new data point XY pair, right? So here the expectation is over this XY pair from uh, the same distribution. Is the setup clear? Any questions? Am I going too slow? Okay, so so kind of the, the, the situation is that the uh, if you want the picture, okay, we have a convex objective that we want, L of W. Okay, I don't know what it looks like. L of W. Uh, this this is the point that we want, right? Over W, over you know set F. This is the set F. So that's the point we want. Uh, instead, what we observe is a a random convex function that might be, I don't know, looks something like that, right? And it's random. Why is it random? Because the data are random. And so when we come up with L hat, that's a random objective. Is that 
up here. So our performance can be only as good as uh, the expected supremum of the difference of the two objectives. Okay? Of course, this is an upper bound, so you can say, well, this can be loose. But for this particular example, this is, as, this is tight up to constants. Right? So uh, what, we, what we can say is that the expected uh, uh, objective that we want, evaluated at the empirical risk minimization solution, at the one that fitted the data, is going to be close to the minimum, the W star, this is the, the black point, up to the, the band that controls the difference of these two functions in expectation. Um, here, I don't think you need an absolute value. So you, know, you can write it as a L of W hat minus uh, um, L hat of W hat plus L hat of W hat minus L of L hat of W star, which is negative, uh, plus uh, L hat of W star minus L of W star, which in expectation is zero. So I think you don't need that absolute value. But you could, it would only um, uh, change things up to a constant. Very good. Okay, quick. Yes. Yeah, I mean, some of the notation phrases you're using are unfamiliar to me. Yes. By out of sample, you just mean generalization error. Generalization error, right. Can you translate other things into sort of fact learning? I mean, W star is a concept you want to learn. To exactly. It. Right, right. And uh, the hats put on L and W make. These are the empirical quantities, okay. the empirical average. Sometimes W as a hat, sometimes L as a hat. Yeah, so W hat, uh, so let, let me write it down so I, we don't, uh, uh, we're not confused. So W hat is the minimizer of the, okay, so L hat of W is uh, 1 over N sum of Yi minus Wxi. I from 1 to n. That's so the empirical. Sorry? It's, minimizer, empirical minimizer. it's an empirical minimizer, right? So the minimization of this is w hat. Hat is argument of l of l hat of w. Yes, please, please ask if some notation is not clear. And w star is the optimal, uh, is the optimal uh, of the expected objective. So this, this, you can think of this as an agnostic pack, if you think of binary prediction, um, except I'm, I'm using the, these as real values. So there's not indicator loss, but the absolute loss for just simplicity. Okay. So um, the point here is that if we could get a handle on this band, uniformly over W, then we're done. Right. And for this example, again, this is kind of the best you can do, up to constants. So that's something to do with DC dimension or? Exactly, exactly, okay. exactly, right. right. Except VC dimension is just one way of upper bounding it, and, and there is a, a better way, well, a potentially tighter way to doing it. Right. So um, if you haven't seen uh, the step, this is called uniform convergence. So any statement of this form uh, um, going to zero, this, this quantity depends on n. And so any statement of this form uh, saying that it goes to zero would, would be a, a statement about uniform convergence, right? Why is it uniform? Because you're saying for any w in my set f, these two uh, uh, curves are, uh, two objectives are uh, close, right? OK, so how, how bad can this be? How do we analyze this? Sorry, what is the expectation over? Uh, OK, good, good. So this ex uh, is a good point. So the question is, what, what is this expectation? Uh, what are the different expectations over? This expectation is over x, y pair. That's the out of sample performance uh, uh, on a new data point, OK? Uh, this expectation is over the data. You draw n data points, and w hat is a random variable in those data. So you have to take an expectation, right? You can make this into a high probability statement as well, but 
this expectation is also over the data. Yes. Are we assuming some boundedness of something somewhere? We will have to, yes. Okay. Yeah, so because next it seems slide. Like you would get things wrong if yeah, you go yeah, yeah. So if you let, uh, in this case, if you let W to be, uh, to go without bound, like F to be unbounded, then nothing, right? But, yeah, exactly. Okay. So let me introduce one more concept, and I think that's pretty much the last kind of. Uh, probably unfamiliar concept to people, so let me spend a little bit of time on it. Uh, it's a concept of uh, um, Rademacher averages, in particular empirical Rademacher averages. And so it says a quick calculation. Uh, uh, so I can do this calculation if you would like, or I can just state the result. Um, so you know, people yell if they want to see it. Uh, let me explain first what the uh, what the quantity. Uh, what the quantities are. The statement is that the, the expected supremum, that this band, the, the width of the band that we are trying to control, can be further upper bounded by twice expected r hat of f. r hat of f is empirical Rademacher complexity. Let me write it down. Empirical Rademacher averages. So I'm going to denote it by r hat of f, and this is going to be expectation with respect to epsilon one through epsilon n. Epsilon one through epsilon n for the rest of the lectures uh, are Rademacher random variables. These are plus minus one 50 50 probability. So coin flip plus minus one, right? Uh, a expected supremum W in F of 1 over N sum of epsilon T uh, W X T T from 1 to N. Okay. So don't X, have X have to be symmetric random variables or something? X's do not have to be symmetric. There's no expectation with respect to X. There is no, uh, right, right. So the, the, the term empirical refers to the fact that we're thinking of x's as fixed at this moment. The only randomness in this quantity is with respect to the random coin flips. That's the only. This yes, the, that's that's the L1 thing. Yes, yes. So uh, the the question is, uh, the the we get to this quantity because indeed because we chose absolute value as the loss function. Um, if you, we chose uh, a square loss, we would get a, a related quantity, but a slightly different. And, and there is a lot of work on you know, what is the right quantity in there. This is just for simplicity. Okay. Now, uh, m maybe it looks scary. So let me show you that it's not scary at all for the cases that we will consider, at least. So take, take f to be equal to uh, x, so the, the x variable will also come from the same set as the f, and it's going to be a Euclidean ball in d dimensions. d will never appear, so it, it can be infinite dimensional if you want. Okay. And that, that's a unit ball. Okay. So if you know about the kind of the, the dual pairs, the reason why we put the covariates in the same space as the w's is because the this is the Euclidean geometry, and the dual of the L2 ball is a L2 ball. OK, so let, let's just think of uh, rewriting this. This is an expectation, epsilon 1 through epsilon n, of a supremum of a w in L2 ball of, uh, well, we can take w out, right? This is a linear function all the way out. So we're going to get w, and then 1 over n sum of epsilon t 
xt. Again, x's are just fixed for now. And of course, you notice that this is a definition of the dual norm. And the dual norm to uh, Euclidean norm is Euclidean. So this is nothing but the expected value of uh, 1 over n sum of epsilon t x t. This is just the Euclidean norm, usually Euclidean norm, right? Now, do Jensen inequality. Put a square and put a square root. Push the expectation into the square root. That is Jensen. That's an upper bound. Open the square. The cross terms cancel because of the expectation. What remains are the norms of the x's. But they live in a unit ball. And there is a square root outside, and there are n of them. Okay, so this is upper bounded by square root of uh, the expected sum of uh, t from 1 to n, 1 over n, um, norm of x t squared. They're bounded in norm by 1. Uh, a, a, um, no, the, the expectation doesn't matter anymore. There's no expectation. Bounded by 1 over square root of n. So this is a very simple calculation. This is a, a, an obvious uh, kind of set uh, where it's super easy to, to, to get the, 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 the upper bound on the width of the band that contains in expectation the, uh, these two curves, right? Yes? Uh, I guess I'm, I'm confused by the, the first inequality in the sense that the expectation on the left-hand side seems to not have anything to do with the expectation on the right-hand side. Yeah, yeah. So, so let me uh, um, um, Do I want to go through the proof? Um, the expectation here is over the x's and the y's, uh, right? Uh, over the n copies of x's and y's. It doesn't depend on y, it just depends on x. Right? Yes, correct. So this side only depends on the random draw of the x's. It does not depend on the random draw of the y's. Uh, but uh, so, so the, the expectation underscore x means, I mean, the little x Oh, no, no. Yeah, okay. so, so this yeah, x yeah. I'm just saying with respect to x1 through xn. Yes, okay, sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Yes? I forgot n squared. 1 over n squared. Or 1 over n squared, thank you. Is everyone comfortable with this calculation? Yes. So in the original big prediction example that you gave, this is pretty much the variance Term that we're getting? Um, not yet, because in that prediction there was no covariates, right? No covariates. So it's slightly different object, but very much related to relate. I, I will show that in the second hour. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, there is something called concentration. I don't know how many people are familiar, which says that a function of many random variables is with high probability uh, uh, close to its expectation, right? So one can apply, assuming boundedness, one can apply uh, the concentration inequalities to say that, in fact, uh, we, we, can, we can, with high probability, replace this expectation by just the Rademacher averages, right? So with, with high probability, by using concentration, we can say it's just the Rademacher averages. Now, Sorry. Yes. So don't we need to show that the Rademacher uh, is actually von Lipschitz for that? Um, yes. So for the example that we have, it's going to be the case, right? Okay. Maybe a different constant, but good enough. Good enough for government work. <laughs> so, uh, 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 so I remember. Uh, looking at this as, as a grad student when I started, and, and uh, I remember being baffled by, by this fact, but because 
you know, what, what this is saying is that you know, we don't know what the distribution is. But the Rademacher average is something we can compute, right? These are data dependent. You have the data in front of you. This is an optimization problem. You just plug it in, right? Flip some coins, and, and uh, here we go. Uh, so, so the statement is that you can guarantee closeness of one curve to another curve, which we actually we don't know, by something that we know, right? It's kind of strange, right? So, so it, it, it says that you can, you can provide a, a certificate that these two curves are similar, uh, even though you don't know what the, uh, what the underlying distribution is to which you're trying to be close, right? Yes? So the inequality only says that average over draws, you have an upper bound in terms of the Rademacher complexity, right? Yes. But if, you act, if I actually give you one single sample, it gives you one sample point on the Rademacher yes. complexity. Yeah, so, so, so uh, I think you're referring to the fact that we need to do concentration here as well, which you can, right. which so you you can do. Right, so you presume your draw is typical in order that's right. to that's get right. a certificate. That's right, that's right, right. 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 So the, the, like in particular, the above inequality is not true sample-wise. Um, uh, um, so w if you do concentration on both sides, sure. then, then, that, then for the... It's not true that for every sample, the supremum Gap is bounded by the Rademacher complexity. With hyper ability, for with hyper, for most, for most, yeah, with hyper ability. So I mean, okay. With hyper ability, right? For one minus delta draws, that's going to be the case. I'm sweeping quite a few things under the rug. Yes. Crucially, mean that the loss function is convex to use density inequality. Yes. Yes. For instance, if you had a number of misclassified things like back learning, you can't. Um, I mean, you cannot get the simple result, maybe, but um, uh, but but all the kind of so there are different ways. Then, if if the function is not linear, I think that's what you're you're asking. If the function is not linear, you cannot pull this out, and you cannot use this simple analysis, right? Oh, okay, right. So any Lipschitz function will give you this up to here. I mean, you can't take the expected. Um, where would you use Janssen? It, it, it's, it's just for this. Uh, but Janssen is only happening at the square root. Yeah. 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 Just to get a quantitative uh, bound, right? That's the only. There are many more refined bounds that one can get that this is kind of the, the simplest possible. Right. So I, I'm just hope, I, I'm just trying to show that you know th th this quantity Rademacher averages it has a long name, it sounds scary, but it's actually a very simple concept, and it's very much related to something that maybe some of you have seen called Gaussian widths. In, if you've seen sparse recovery, it's just you know you replace the epsilons with the Gaussian random variables. I, I, again, IID, uh, it's roughly the same concept. Okay. Yes, that would lead to, uh, to a supreme of a Gaussian process rather than supreme of a Rademacher process. You can go, you know, so there, there are complicated relationships, maybe up to log n, you can you know, go from one to another. In one direction, you go without any, you know, paying anything. Okay, so uh, that, that's what we did. Um, um, so I, I, again, what I, what I want to stress is that it's, it's um, the, the, the Performance of ERM, performance of best fit to data, is actually as good as one over square root of n, right? So we essentially proved that because these two curves are within one over square root of n, when you minimize one objective, which is not <coughs> the right objective, you still optimize the correct objective, right? Is this this uh, clear? Right. So, so somehow, right? Uh, the the because we phrase the problem in terms of the expected objective, but we can only do the empirical objective, we have to somehow relate the two, right? That's kind of the, that's the idea. Okay, so here, just again, this is a very classical result, statistical learning, expected error of the empirical risk minimizer is with hyper ability, no more than the expected risk, the ex expected error of the best model up to uh, this uh, empirical rather macro complexity, okay? And I'm, I'm being vague, of course, here. And of course, this heavily relies on the fact that data are IID. Right. 
OK, so empirical radar marker is the upper bound on the, the performance of empirical risk minimization. Okay, that's that's what uh, you should take out of this. Just a few more details. The proof that I gave, of course, uh, works for any pair of the dual primal dual norms, right? Because the only thing we used, well, if, if f is a ball in some norm, not necessarily Euclidean norm, then of course you pull out the w, and that's just the definition of the dual norm. And, and so you get the star here, that's the dual norm, right? The, by, by definition of the dual norm, right? And so now, now we can talk about the different pairs, L1, L infinity, uh, Lp and Q with a conjugate PQ. Um, and, and in particular, you can talk about the, um, the nuclear norm ball. I will, okay, next slide. But for L1, let's just see what the uh, L1 result is. If you take L1, then the dual is L infinity. And uh, for L infinity, it's easy to see. I'm going to be using the, the less than or equal with a squiggle, uh, meaning I'm, I am omit any constants, right? So this is just the dependence on the parameters. Square root of log dimension divided by n. That's the result that you would get. If you already know about experts, probably only a couple of you, this should remind you of the experts bound, the exponential weights bound. Uh, and indeed, th that's the connection that I would like to get to. Uh, um, the connection between the empirical Radamacher averages and the, the exponential weights or the weighted majority algorithm. Okay. So, to, so for the L2, L2 pair, uh, there was no dimension dependence. So you could be working in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space. For uh, um, L1, L infinity, for instance, dimension does appear. Uh, and, and, and yes, Pablo. Can you say quickly how is this bounds on F essentially based on Radamacher compared to the delay to DC? Um, so uh, a, a VC is not a linear, right? So, so for VC, you would say that this is not a linear function. It's a binary valued function of x. And uh, then uh, given the x's, you're looking at what are the different sign patterns you can achieve using different uh, f's. Yeah, I'm saying if it's bounded in BC, they, you know, can it somehow disemplace it or the other way? Uh, they, they don't apply. No, they don't apply each other. Right. So the, 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 once you move away from linear functions and talk about binary valued functions, you really have to be thinking now about subsets of the hypercube and the richness of those subsets. And what VC theory, the wapnik chernenkis theory, gives you is how rich those subsets are uh, in terms of something called a VC dimension. And, and, and um, right. you talk about real value generalizations and that's right, right. And the right. You, you, right, that's right, right, right. So, so you, mm. you, can, you can bound Radamacher averages using covering numbers, Dudley entropy integral. Uh, there's a whole machinery for doing so. Uh, this is the, the, most, the, the most basic, right? And, and um, maybe I, I, I'm not going to go into this. Uh, right. Right. OK, so l let me talk about the nuclear norm ball. And, and the dual is spectral norm. So that's hopefully uh, clear to people. Uh, in that case, the Radamacher averages, and that, that this is the movie prediction problem, right? Is going to be the uh, spectral norm of this random matrix. And there are, you know, we, 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 we know a lot of different ways of uh, bounding this. And, and just a very kind of quick, the, you know, the, the matrix Bernstein uh, uh, result would tell you it's 1 over n, because this is 1 over n. Uh, v, which is the maximum of the spectral norm of the inner product and the outer product, right? Now, let's just think about this for the matrix example. And, and by the way, there is, again, there is a machinery of analyzing random matrix, spectral norms of random matrices in terms of different parameters. And this is just one way of doing it. In fact, there is a, a workshop up the hill at MSRI on, on this subject. So we can all go there and ask them. OK. Uh, so for the matrix completion example, OK, this is the x. Um, and then it's clear that the v squared, uh, the variance uh, uh, parameter is, well, when you take these uh, matrix times the matrix, you're just going to get something on the diagonal, right? And now you're adding it up over the different uh, 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 examples. And so essentially, it is the number, maximum of the number of uh, uh, 
uh, times a column is repeated and the maximum number of times the row is repeated, right? So you could get uh, uh, easily uh, this result, right? The, 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 the NC and NR are the maximum frequency of movie or, or person occurrence, right? And so let's just get a, get a, get a sense of uh, uh, X's are fixed here, but let's just hypothesize that X's are random. So let's go back to this setting where X's are IID. We, we observe the movie user pairs completely at random. Then, uh, you know, how many do you expect for each, uh, 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 for each column? One well, roughly uh, N divided by P, right? P is the, is the dimension of the matrix. Um, let's just assume that P is equal to N, M. So there are the same number of users as the movies. Um, then if you use the uh, uh, trace norm ball with, the, uh, with this parameter, then you get a result uh, of square root of R P over N. And that means that you get some non-trivial performance as soon as uh, the number of examples that you see uh, is a proportional to just one side of the matrix, right? The, 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 let's say the number of users, right? So that, that's already interesting because the uh, um, right, you, you only need to see not the uh, not the product of the dimensions, but just one dimension for the learning to to, to start kicking in. However, this heavy, heavily relies on uh, uniform sampling, right? Which we don't believe is is true. Um, but I just want to give you a sense that the the rather macro complexity already captures um, uh, uh, the the data dependent. Uh, a, a, a structure of the problem, right? What, 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 are the, what the, how many times uh, a, a user movie pair was picked and so forth. And of course, in the worst case sampling, all of them are on the same user movie pair. And so we get a useless result, which is P squared over N. And so the kind of learning only kicks in uh, when N is equal to uh, of the same order as P squared, which is not interesting, right? You want to get generalization before you see all the entries. Um, I, I want to say that there are better results than this uh, by uh, uh, Shamir and Shai Shalaf Schwartz, where they use the boundedness of the entries to improve this p squared. Um, but I will not uh, talk about that. Okay. So now, um, yes. So by worst case sampling, you mean if the distribution was very skewed? Very, uh, very, very, very spiky. Skewed. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what what else could we have done? Well, we, we, so far we analyzed empirical risk minimization. Well, another thing we could have done is uh, treat the, this minimization problem of the expected objective, right, the out of sample objective, as the uh, stochastic op op optimization problem, and uh, go through the data once and do stochastic uh, 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 optimization, right? Right, so this is a, just a projected gradient descent where each gradient nabla t is the gradient of the loss at a fresh data point x t y t. Right? This is well known, well understood. Uh, it is an unbiased estimate of the gradient of the expected objective as long as we never repeat the data point more than once. Right? So if we start going through the data more than once, this is no longer an unbiased estimate. Right? So conditionally on the, on the past, we should be uh, having fresh uh, data, right? <coughs> now, this approach, in fact, has been very influential in uh, machine learning and arguably led to the successes of uh, deep uh, learning. Yes, I get to say this. Uh, <laughs> okay. um, and, and, and so people uh, like Shai Shalaf Schwartz and, uh, et al. wrote this influ influential paper uh, on uh, the Pegasus, uh, Leon Boutou in the machine learning community has been advocating the use of stochastic gradient descent instead of the empirical minimization objective, right? Because this somehow goes directly after the expected objective, right? So, yes? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You still have that assumption, yes, yes. We will be removing it if I get to it. <laughs> um, uh, so I have three minutes left. So let, let me say that there seems to be two approaches. Uh, and and uh, one is called SA. That's another name, the stochastic approximation. The other one is SAA, 
sample average approximation. There's a nice paper by Nimerovsky and others on, on, on the two, uh, on these two possibilities. And, and um, these two uh, different approaches, uh, if you think that this is a new kind of idea, uh, let's go back to the 1963. Uh, uh, this is a quote from Vapnik's uh, Nature of Statistical Learning Theory. Inspired by Novikov's theorem, so what is Novikov's theorem? Uh, if you know Perceptron, uh, this was the first <coughs> learning machine, right? The beginning of machine learning. Uh, the Novikov theorem says that if data are separable, linearly separable, then uh, there is only a finite number of adjustments by this gradient descent procedure that will happen until you find a hyperplane which is consistent with uh, the data. Okay, so inspired by Novikov theorem, Tsipkin, who is you know, famous uh, control, I guess, theorist, and Eisermann started discussions on consistency of learning processes in 1963. Okay, uh, maybe I should switch to a Russian uh, accent. In 1963, <laughs> at the seminars of the Moscow Institute of Control Science, uh, two general inductive principles uh, that ensure consistency of learning processes, the laughter is not being picked up by the right? <laughs> uh, unfortunate. Uh, uh, consistency of learning processes were under investigation. One is the principle of stochastic approximation, the other one the principle, principle of empirical risk minimization, uh, which are the, the two approaches that I would outline. Uh, and by the 1971, uh, two types of theories have been developed. One is the general asymptotic theory of stochastic approximation, um, and, and the other one is non-asymptotic theory by Vapnik Chermenenkis uh, uh, for the empirical risk minimization. Okay? so. Um, uh, uh, this is not definitely not a not a new idea. Now I, I want to get at least uh, 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 kind of to end uh, 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 this hour with uh, an interesting puzzle, and, and I want to just go through the proof of stochastic gradient descent. Right? Uh, it will be non-asymptotic proof. Of course, this is a convex problem. We know exactly what the rate of convergence is. So uh, what you do is you do stochastic gradient descent with these unbiased uh, estimates. And then you form the what's called the Pollack average of the trajectory, right? So you, you do the gradient descent, then you average the iterates, and that's your W bar. So there, there was a W hat, now it's a W bar. W bar is the average of the trajectory of the stochastic gradient descent. Now, what do you do? Well, you say, the, how well does the L, uh, W bar do with respect to any W star, the, maybe the optimal one? Well, by convexity, you upper bound by the average of the suboptimalities. And then you linearize the problem, right? It's kind of a standard way of doing it. Uh, and, and because the gradients are unbiased, you know, given the past, um, you can write the expected suboptimality of the, you know, the performance of W bar as expected average of these uh, products, right? And this is like the first course you take on convex optimization, right? But then what you use is actually a completely deterministic statement. What is then used is that this quantity inside of the expectation is bounded by, say, 1 over square root of n or something like that, and the rate of convergence. And, and this proof is completely deterministic. It's just a potential argument. right? You look at the distance square to the optimal point uh, and, and how that changes. And so what you actually do is what's, what's called a regret you get a deterministic regret statement that uh, this quantity is small, right? Now, the bound that you're going to get through this analysis, which I will put and, 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 and finish here, um, is, gives you a 1 over square root of n, which is exactly the same as you've gotten from empirical risk minimization. So, uh, of course, it's an upper bound, but it, it tells you that the W bar has the same performance guarantee as uh, w hat, and if I were to write out the parameters that are hidden here, up to constants, they would be the same. And so the question that we'll discuss in the next uh, hour, is this a coincidence or not? And you'll see that actually it's not a, a coincidence. It has a deeper uh, um, connections uh, 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 between online methods, regret methods of this form, and uniform convergence results that you use for the empirical risk minimization. Okay, so I guess in half an hour, we'll break. Any questions? Questions with or without Russian accent? <laughs> <laughs> so
the slide where you introduced Radomani complexity, there was something about the tightness. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, so you can uh, provide a lower bound on the, on the excess loss in terms of Radomacher complexity as well uh, uh, um, for the absolute loss function that we use. You can also provide a lower bound on the expected supremum of the deviation of empirical and expected uh, uh, in terms of Radomacher complexity. So the Radomacher complexity and the uniform deviations are related on both sides up to a constant, a multiplicative constant. It's a worst case lower bound. Um, for the learning, for learning, yes, but for uniform deviations, it's uh, it's not the, a um, it's not a worst case statement. I can show the calculation on, offline. Focus. Okay, then let's uh, have half an hour break and. Uh, see.